What you then had was the paradigm shift. In the Renaissance, the, the church which had been Platonized by Augustine was challenged by the Aristotelianism of the Thomists, medieval scholasticism, those who followed Aquinas. So you had a fight in the church between those who reinterpreted and misinterpreted Christianity as a Platonic religion against those who misinterpreted it and reinterpreted it as an Aristotelian religion. The changing philosophical worldview was causing people to try to redefine Christianity in those terms instead of recontextualizing it. A similar thing is happening today. Changing worldviews. The paradigm shift. And you're finding this. We dealt with this in the Leader Seminar. People are simply redefining Christianity as a New Age religion. But let's move on. You had mendicant orders. Mendicant orders of clergy. Before the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church was right with mendicantism. Untrained, uneducated people in the clergy as their pastors and leaders. That's what they had. Today you have the same thing. I myself go to an Assembly for God church and I'm a Pentecostal minister, full gospel minister. The old time Pentecostals, except in Scotland, where there were more educated Pentecostals, the old time Pentecostals, the founders of Pentecostalism, never had too many Greek or Hebrew scholars. But they did know the Bible. They did have a solid doctrinal theology. They knew why they were premillennial. They knew why they were not cessationists. They knew why they had the pneumatology they did. They had a grasp of Scripture. In the Bible, Peter was not formally educated. But he did know the Word of God. Paul was formally educated, so was Apollos. In his epistle, Peter commends the ministry of Paul, doesn't he? He says, these things are complicated. It's better for Paul to explain it. The apostles realized that there would be ways that God could use somebody formally trained and educated in theology that he couldn't use somebody who wasn't. That's not to say God can't use people who are not formally trained. Did God use Peter? Of course he did. But there were certain things that Peter said it's better for Paul to write and teach and explain. Paul, in turn, pointed to Apollos. Apollos may have had more understanding of the Scripture than Paul. May have had. You'll find church histories like that. You have a man like D.L. Moody, a fifth grade education, who God used tremendously. But there were certain things he left to R.A. Torrey. Today, it's not like that. The levels of biblical knowledge and theological education among the Pentecostal and charismatic clergy are absolutely deplorable. But it's worse than that. I have a friend who's an Anglican theologian, an evangelical, and although I wouldn't agree with all of his doctrine, he's competent. Dr. Steve Mortier. His father is a famous Anglican preacher in the British Isles. Nice guy and competent. I asked him once, how come you'd have Anglican bishops following people like Paul Cain and the Kansas City prophets, absolute maniacs, people who are heretical, people who predict wild things that failed to happen. How come Anglican clergy and even bishops will follow these people? And he told me, it's because Anglican theological education for decades has been dominated by higher criticism instead of doctrinal knowledge. The purely academic study of the Bible as history and literature. It has its value, but not necessarily any doctoral value. You have people with doctorates with PhDs in academic theology who are unsaved. I've even met born-again Christians with PhDs in theology that have never led anyone to Christ and wouldn't know how to do it. Give me an old-time Timothy standing on a soapbox any day. So, first of all, theological education itself 
has been reduced to a purely academic exercise with no doctrinal application necessarily coming from it. That's not to denigrate whatever value there is in the academic study of the Bible as history and literature. I studied that stuff myself for years. I'm not putting down grammatical historical exegesis by any means. I'm simply saying biblical studies are not necessarily revelation studies, doctrine. Of course, among charismatics, it's much worse. They have no tradition of biblical training. It's experience-oriented. It's all experiential from the word go. God showed me. I have a picture. I have a word. Things we'll look at in the next session. Absolute rubbish. Modern-day Pentecostalism, you look at the young kids coming out of most of the Pentecostal Bible college. They do not have the Pentecostalism of their fathers and grandfathers. The only thing these kids know are what the mendicant orders of the Middle Ages knew. Hype, gimmicks, the next cliche, the next slogan. That's all they know. That's all they know. The next line of hype, the next gimmick, the next cliche, that's all they know. Mendicant clergy. You see, you have to understand that the kinds of seductions with which Satan tried to destroy the early church after the apostles have all made a comeback in the last century, particularly in the last 10, 15 years. The early church called the Montanists. Today, we call them Toronto. Same thing happened. Same thing happened. The early church called them Arians. Today we call them Jehovah's Witnesses. The same Christology. The early church called them Sabellians. Today we call them Jesus only. United Pentecostals. The early church would have called them, we call them Judaizers. People living under two covenants. Today we call them Seventh-day Adventists. The early church called them Gnostics. Today we call it the Restoration Movement. It's the same thing. And we'll come back to this in our next session. Because you have such low levels of biblical knowledge and theological education among the current generation of Pentecostals and the Charismatics who never had it, they'll swallow anything not knowing it. I went to a seminar once for an hour and a half. I listened to a guy named Cole Springer in Australia. A men's seminar. This is a guy who's teaching men how to be spiritual men. For an hour and a half, he didn't mention Jesus Christ once. And he had two verses. The joy of the Lord is my strength, and a wise man controls his spirit. And he's going to teach the men how to be men from those two verses. He talked about how his bungalow up in Darwin, Australia, was destroyed in a monsoon. But how he was able to laugh about it because the joy of the Lord was his strength and because he controlled his spirit. And he talked like this. His whole emphasis was not the Lord, but the joy. <laughs> the joy, biblically, is derivative from the Lord. You can lose your bungalow, which is insured or whatever, but what about when God forbid you lose your only child? Let me see your joy see you through that. Your joy won't, the Lord will. Like that hymn, it is well in my soul. The guy lost his whole family at a storm at sea. He was able to say, it is well in my soul. Why? Because of his joy? No, because of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength, but the joy is derivative from the Lord. But this guy had it on the joy. And if this is what he's teaching men, how to be men, and the heads of their families and leaders in churches. This is rubbish. When a crisis comes, those guys will collapse. These are the kinds of people we have going around talking rubbish. They don't know any better. What's it say in First Timothy about people like Bill Zabritsky and Cole Springer? They run around making pronouncements about things they don't know what they're talking about. They haven't got a clue. And after 30 years of charismatic renewal, there's no renewal. Crime goes up. Divorce goes up. New age goes from strength to strength. And the church gets weaker and weaker because you're following men who don't have a clue what they're talking about. 
the very thing First Timothy warned us about. Am I against these men personally? No. The Bible says to exhort with great patience and instruction, not grotumia, but that's the people, not the leaders. Look how Jesus talked to the leaders who were misleading the people. They built their careers, their empires on error. And Jesus told them that in Matthew 23. It says in James, let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. Unless they truly repent, these guys like Benny Hinn and Bill Zabritsky are not going to get away with this. Woe to all of us, including me. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. So you have this then, mendicant clergy. Untrained, uneducated men going around with cliches, trying to hype people up, get money out of people, giving them one formula, one program after another, none of which works. Again, the reformers were second generation humanist scholars. They were not simply from the Roman Catholic Church, they were from the intelligentsia of it. They reacted against this. They reacted against this. What you had was those who were trained in the Word of God reacting against those who were not. Today, if there's a need, it is for those who are trained in the Word of God to stand up and challenge those who are not. I'm here to do it. Come on, John Arnott debate me. Rodney Brown refused to do it in Birmingham. Sir, you have to leave the building. I'm sorry. You will have to leave the building. We'll, be... we'll have to edit this bit out of the tape. I'll be happy to engage in any debate when we finish the session. Sir, you, can you please leave the building? Always have a time for questions, debate after we finish the presentation. I invite anyone to challenge anything I say, to question anything I say. There is a need for those who are trained in the Word of God to challenge the hype and the asegetical pronouncements of those who aren't. You don't need to be a great scholar to understand that it says, repent and have a refreshing, not have a refreshing and a repentance. You don't need to be scholarly to do that. You just need to be literate. Mendicant orders were a characteristic of the pre-Reformation church. What you also had was a dominionism. Kingdom now theology. It had its roots with the ostensible conversion of Constantine the Great. Where the church became a political power. This was continued throughout the Roman ages and the, the, the Middle Ages with the medieval Roman church where the Pope wanted to establish his kingdom on earth and he claimed the inheritance of Constantine and things like this to establish kingdom now. Unfortunately, the mainstream reformers substituted a Catholic version of this with the Protestant version. The Anabaptists, the Baptist sects refused. They said Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. But Calvin set up a theocratic police state virtually in, in Geneva. Zor, uh, Zurich had one set up by uh, Zwingli and so on. You had this idea of dominion theology, of reconstructionism, of the church becoming a political power and establishing the legal system and trying to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. This came as a result of post-millennial eschatology. Those who said it was somehow fulfilled in the church. The pre nicene church was chiefly premillennial. The apostolic church, premillennial. Amillennial theology is not right, but it's not dangerous. Postmillennial theology is quite dangerous. Anytime the church is vibed to become a political power, it's always brought some kind of a disaster. And you had that happening at the advent of the Reformation. And you certainly have the rise of triumphalism, kingdom now theology once again. Again, going back to George Warnock, the manifest sons of God, the latter day reign movement, what underlies much of the vineyard, and so on. After this, you had the Reformation coming on the heels of two other things. One was the rise in Christian anti-Semitism. The 1490s saw the Inquisitions in Spain. 
Not all the victims of the Inquisition were Jews, but they were chief targets. A rise of Christian anti-Semitism propagated in the church. Torture and the rest of it. You have the same thing happening now. We have two kinds of people. We have those who are over the top about Israel. People who say we can bless the Jews with evangelizing Israel. And instead of having a biblical view of the prophetic purposes of God for Israel, put Israel at the center instead of Christ. The Lord Jesus is the fundamental truth through which we view all other truth. All other truth must be based upon him. If you put another truth in place of him, that truth will become an error, even though it may be true. For instance, there is a biblical doctrine of prosperity in Deuteronomy 8. But when you take that biblical doctrine of prosperity and make the focus of the Christian message prosperity instead of salvation, the biblical doctrine of prosperity becomes false, and you wind up with name it and claim it. You wind up with uh, hyper-faith, which is not faith at all, but rather covetousness masquerading as faith, and the worship of mammon masquerading as Christianity. A truth becomes a lie. Jesus is the prism through which we look at all of the scripture. He is the truth upon which all of the truth is built. You have unity. The Bible speaks of unity. Father, I pray they may be one, as we are one, that the world may know that I sent thee. Our testimony to the unsaved depends on our unity. However, the unity that the Bible teaches is the unity of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, not of error. You cannot have a unity of the Spirit based on error. 1 Corinthians 11.19, there must be factions among you to prove which is true. The Greek word for factions is heresy. 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 Heresy is supposed to produce division. Supposed to. Romans 16, 17. The word there is dikostasia. Mark the factious man who is among you. The word factious there, dikostasia, those who depart from the teachings of the apostles. When people depart from biblical doctrine, it's supposed to be a dikostasia. We get the word dichotomy, a split. Yet people will put this idea of unity at the center and have an ecumenical movement. Let us have one person, it says in Proverbs. Let us build with you, as it says in Ezra. Our God is your God. But Zerubbabel said, you have nothing in common with us in building unto our God. You can only have a unity of the Spirit based on truth. Again, once the truth of Jesus and his doctrine that he gave the apostles, it's not at the center, but unity comes at the center. You wind up with a unity that's a false unity. You wind up with the road to Babylon. You wind up with ecumenism instead of unity of the Spirit. You wind up with lowest common denominator basis of unity, where the truth is compromised for the sake of it. Well, so it is with Israel. I certainly acknowledge the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. God's plan for the salvation of the world is prophetically bound up with his plan for the salvation of Israel and the Jews. I firmly, firmly, and continually reiterate my conviction and the prophetic significance of contemporary events in the Middle East. Those who deny it are misguided. These are signs of the return of Christ. However, when people put Israel at the center, you wind up with these crazy doctrines like the Christian embassy. We can bless the Jews without evangelizing them. That's not biblical. Paul says that they have no preacher, how shall they hear? If they were going to comfort, comfort thee, my people. But the text says, comfort my people, comfort my people in Isaiah 40. Say to her, her iniquity is removed. The only way her iniquity can be removed is what you read in verse 9 of Isaiah 40, giving her the gospel. This Torah in Hebrew. So you have those extremes. On the other extreme, because of kingdom now theology, you have this view that we're going to conquer the whole world for Christ and set up his kingdom before he comes. Therefore, they can now allow no prophetic place of purpose for Israel or the Jews. The return of Christ depends on them. So even though Jesus said to the Jews, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They say that can't be. It's got to depend on us. Hence, you have the vehement anti-Israelism of people like Rick Godwin in America. Christian preacher, so-called, who says Matthew 24 is not about the last days. 
very dangerous man. When you begin saying the things that Jesus gave so the church would not be deceived or unprepared for his return, like the Olivet Discourse, and say it's not about the last days, you're taking the very things that Jesus gave so we would not be deceived and unprepared and saying they're not about the last days. That's the deception of Satan. And Mr. Godwin teaches, and you have these hyper-reconstructionist Calvinists that get it from, people like David Chilton and Gary North and so on, all influenced by Mr. Rush to me. And they begin saying and teaching this stuff. But Mr. Godwin goes on to say the Jews have no right to be in that land. Israel has no right to exist. It's nothing but wasted money. All this kind of stuff. You've got this rise of Christian anti-Semitism even in the evangelical church now. Many evangelical Lutherans endorsed Hitler. Endorsed Hitler. And now you see a reemergence of this kind of thing. This kind of rise in anti-Semitism precipitated the Reformation, the Inquisitions. Now, the Inquisitions again went beyond the anti-Semitic. After the Reformation, it was the Jesuits who became the chief agents of papal extermination of those who professed faith in Jesus according to the Gospel. Before the Reformation, it was the Dominicans. They, they tortured and murdered half a million people. And their founder, St. Dominic, of course, was canonized a saint. Attributed to Dominic is the teaching that uh, because Eve was made from a woman's, uh, the rib of Adam and, and, and the rib is curved, women are crooked. And he found then that this idea that women are evil. And the Dominicans would do these, they would torture women. They would do these, they would drive hot packs through their tongues and and vaginally pump boiling water into them and all this kind of stuff. This was the Dominicans, St. Dominic. Uh, you had this kind of stuff before the Reformation. But the chief victims of this were the Jews. Now, you see the same thing in the 20th century. We've seen the Holocaust, which had certainly the widespread backing and endorsement of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in Catholic Europe. But even much of the Lutheran hierarchy. And I'm quite troubled to see the resurgence of Christian anti-Semitism coming on the back of, of Kingdom Now theology and replacementism in evangelical circles. The other thing you had was the rise of Islam. The rise of Islam. The Muslims at one time reached as far as Vienna, twice. Islam has made many attempts to invade Western civilization. And it's doing it again. Militant Islam. The Saudi Arabian and, and Kuwaiti governments are funding the construction of mosques all over Great Britain, but will not allow one mosque to be built in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. It will expect British citizens to go and, or American citizens to go and fight to defend Saudi Arabia from other Muslims. Islam, you read people like Ahmed Didat or the late... Uh, Salim Kadiki, they claim to have an agenda from God to Islamize Western society. And certainly New Zealand is on their agenda. Militant Islam is filtering into this country already from Malaysia. And what's happening in Britain today, when you see people trying to uh, kill Rushdie for writing a book and to ban the preaching of the gospel publicly, because if you say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you blaspheme Islam, those laws will begin to be introduced in your country eventually. The threat of Islam to Western society and Western freedom to be Christian occurred before and it will occur again. But not only that, the reason it gained the momentum that it did was because of the backslidden and doctrinally abject state of the church. Islam would not be making the gains it is today if we had a Christ-centered Bible-preaching church. Those Muslims coming to Western countries would be being saved. So the opposite has happened. Westerners are turning to Islam. The Islamic threat was around before the Reformation. It's around today. But there's one more comparison at least. In fact, there's many more. You can talk about all kinds of things. The books and manuscripts of the Middle Ages, if you've been like to Ireland, for instance, and you saw the Book of Kells in the museum in Dublin, the manuscripts were made easier to read by pictorial illustrations. 
Well, today it's the same. We call them Windows. Windows 95, Windows 96 software programs using pictures and graphics to help people to become computer literate. The same as pictures were used to help people to become literate in the codexes of the Middle Ages before the Reformation. You understand? There are many, many comparisons. More than we can go into. But perhaps the final one I'll mention now is the two things. One, splits. Splits. There were already internal fights between the Jansen, with the Jansenist schism and the Thomists and, the, and, and those who followed Aquinas and the Aristotelian view opposing those who followed the old views of Plato, the Platonic views go date back to Augustine and his Memphis. But then you had split fermenting between those who wanted a more biblical interpretation of the Christian faith and those who didn't. And fragmentation already began to take place within the religious orders, which were in effect, the religious orders of the Middle Ages were in effect the equivalent of denominations today. Although they'd all claimed to be under the Pope in some way and have the same faith, they would definitely be rivals for followings and for influence and power. The way you have Baptists and Brethren and Pentecostals today, the orders were the equivalent of denominations in effect then. And you had fragmentations and splits, polarizations between these orders, but also within them. Today in the United Kingdom, the Assemblies of God is heading for a split. There are 200 Assemblies of God ministers and something known as the Link Movement, traditional Pentecostals who cannot endure things like Toronto, the centralization and the hierarchicalization of the Assemblies of God and so on. In Britain, there's much disenchantment over the ecumenical issue. Those who have gone in with Rome and the liberals and those who do not, do not wish to. You have increasing polarization within the denominations. Much the same as you have the same kind of fermenting schism within the orders of the Middle Ages. And it's interesting, in the Counter-Reformation, to try to stop what was happening, the Roman Church became more centralized and more hierarchical with the Council of Trent, giving even more power to the central theocracy under the Pope. Today it's the same. The denominations get more and more hierarchical, more and more centralized. They begin putting theocratic pressures on the individual ministers. Don't allow Hank Hanegraaff's book to be sold in your church. Come and support Rodney Brown. Keep away from Jacob Pratt. The same thing. Get more and more hierarchical and centralized to try to keep power for themselves and stop the fragmentation, which is inevitable. You had fermenting splits even before the Reformation within the orders. The most conspicuous being the common life brethren, which brings me to my last final point. Before the Reformation, before Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door, before Zwingli in Zurich, which actually be, he began a Reformation actually before Luther in a sense, before any of this, you had people who were trying to change the established church from within. You had sincere people trying to change the established order from within, trying to put new wines into old wine skins, as it were. It goes back at least to the time of Francis of Assisi. Now, he was crazy in his doctrine, putting ashes in his food. He had a lot of crazy ideas. But the man was a sincere person, and he realized that the church had gone away from the simple teaching of Jesus and tried to get back to it. The Franciscans ended as corrupt as everyone else, but they didn't begin that way. You had people even after the Reformation and before, trying to change it from within. But failed. Madame Guillaume, she was one. John of the Cross, he was another, imprisoned by his own church. They were persecuted by their own church. You had the humanist scholars like Erasmus, John Collett, people who were trying to change the church from within. But they failed and failed and failed. You had the common life brethren, you had Thomas the Kempis, who was of the common life brethren, who wrote the book, The Imitation of Christ. The true Christian. You had many sincere people within the established religious order who were trying desperately, desperately to change it and reform it from within and call it back to the Bible. 
and they did nothing but fail. It's like the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement was used of the Lord to touch a lot of people individually, but it failed to either bring renewal to the church or revival to society. You have the Catholic charismatics. The charismatic movement of the Roman Catholic Church has failed to change any of the these doctrines of Roman Catholicism. Do you think charismatic Catholics go to Mass to change it from within and they're really saying to the person next to them, Shh, that priest in that box really can't forgive your sins, you have to be born again? That's really not biblical. you think they're saying, Shh, that bread and wine, that's not really Jesus incarnate. Are they doing that? No, of course not. The whole thing's absurd. You had sincere and well-intended people who tried to change the established religious order from within and despite their noble attempts and despite whatever blessing they brought to individuals, their attempts and their movements failed. Today it's the same. In the Western Protestant nations, any attempt to reform the Baptist Union from within or to reform the Assemblies of God from within is a point of no return. Once you've gone beyond that point where the doctrine, where the Bible, where the gospel is compromised, where the authority of Scripture is compromised, where people are willing to see the gospel publicly discredited by charlatans, once things reach that level of moral and doctrinal depravity, you're not going to change it from within. The Assemblies of God is doing well in some countries like Italy. They won't tolerate this stuff. But in countries like this, or Britain, America even, there is no way. The fragmentation is already there. David Wilkerson refused to renew his credentials with the Assemblies of God as one example. The fragmentation is underway. It was only the beginning. Any attempt to reform churches from within that have embraced ecumenism, that have gone into Toronto, that have given place to the, to the heresy of Kenneth Copeland, any attempt to reform them from within will totally and categorically fail. Sincere and well-intended people may try, but they will not succeed. The charismatic movement of, within the Roman Catholic Church will fail. It's under Cardinal Sunim. Believe me, if John of the Cross and Madame Guillaume and Francis of Assisi and Thomas uh, or Kempis could not reform the Roman Catholic Church from within, they're not going to do it either. Babylon cannot be healed, Jeremiah 51. You've got to make a choice. Before the Reformation, the humanists tried. It didn't win. It didn't work. Luther was the natural result. The question is, will there be another Reformation in the Western world? Only now it is not simply Roman Catholicism. It is evangelical, Pentecostal, and charismatic churches which need the Reformation. Now we are the indulgence merchants. Now we are the monument builders. Now we are the relic mongers. Now we are the corrupt and uneducated clergy. Will there be a Reformation? Can revival come to the Western Protestant democracies? I personally believe that despite our sin, if God has his way, God wants to give the Western Protestant democracies and the English-speaking democracies above all one more chance to repent before Jesus comes. I believe he wants that. But it will not happen if we keep going these same routes to nowhere that won't work. Unless we have people who will stand up to Copeland and Paul Crouch and Pat Robinson and Marilyn Hickey and Bill Sapritsky, the way that men stood up to Tetzel and Pope Julius and John Eck. It's not going to happen. What they tried to do was get other intellectuals to debate Luther. They got John Eck. Today they try to get that, that guy William D. Ortega, somebody who's academically trained semi-heretic, or virtually is a heretic, he endorses the cult things, William the Ortega. The same thing. Can it happen? 
Will we get people who will stand up to the Tetzels? Will we get people who will stand up to the John X? Will we get people who will stand up to Pope Julius? Will you get people who will stand up to Paul Crouch and Kenneth Copeland and John Avanzini? Will you get people to do this? Will you find people who realize that new wine will not go into old wineskins? Things have gone too far for too long. Will you get that? Or will you find people trying to be like the common life brethren in Erasmus, trying to change that from within, which is no longer changeable because it's gone too far? Will there be a second reformation? We have the relics. We have the building programs. We have the mendicant clergy. We have the Eastern religious influx. We have the threat of Islam. We have the resurgent anti-Semitism. We have the papal bulls. We have the remarriage of science with the occult. We have the pilgrimage. We have the denigration of the Word of God itself. We have everything the Reformation had. We have the Thomas Moores. We have the John X. We have the Pope Juliuses. We have the Tetzels. Where are the Luthers? God bless you. Let's have a break. Here's a false doctrine which says that the church is new Israel, that God has effectively finished with Israel and the Jews, and the church has replaced it. This is contrary to the teaching of Scripture, particularly Romans 11. Romans 11 says that non-Jews who accept Jesus are grafted into the olive tree and replace Jews who reject him. It does not say there's a new olive tree. Non-Jews who accept Jesus replace the Jews who reject him, but it's the same tree. Romans 11 speaks the language of incorporation, not replacement. We similarly see the same thing in Ephesians, where it says, You who are strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, Gentile Christians who have faith in the Jewish Messiah are no longer separated from it. In a spiritual sense, the church is incorporated into Israel, but it's not a new Israel. The doctrine was largely propagated uh, following Constantine. Well, it actually began even before Constantine, but actually became official church dogma around the time of Constantine, even though its rudiments go back to the second century. So, yes, thank you for your teaching this morning, Joe. There's many things I'm going to have to rethink, and I'm sure many people here. Uh, one thing I would like enlightenment on is um, some comments regarding the deliverance ministry, which has been a very much an integral part of the charismatic move, move and possibly in the light of three scriptures. Um, Jesus, we know, cast out demons, and he said in John 14:12, If any man believe in me, uh, have faith in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. The second scripture is his... Um, his admonition to go in, in Mark 16 to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature he who is saved uh, uh, believes shall be baptized saved um, he who believes not is damned and these signs shall follow those who believe in my name shall they cast out demons and also in the light of um, 1 Corinthians 10 the gifts of the spirit uh, and one of them of course is the discerning of spirits. So if you could help me in the light yes. of those three scriptures. Thank you. Yes. I certainly believe in the biblical ministry or the biblical practice of casting out demons. However, the Greek word to cast out is ek balo. Ek balo. Ek meaning out and balo where you get the word ballistic to shoot. The word ek balo is never used in connection with a Christian. Man is made in God's image and likeness. God is triune and he made us triune. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Demonic oppression is one thing. When someone is oppressed by an evil spirit, the word used in Greek is normally therapeo, healed of those who had demons. Now the Bible says, uses three basic Greek words for being demonized. One is, I suppose you'd say demonized. The other is demoned, and the other is having a demon. You can't draw a distinction from those words. What you can draw a distinction from is where it uses the adjectives or the description like oppression. When someone is oppressed by a spirit, when they are being physically afflicted by a spirit, like the way Paul had a thorn of Satan to buffet him, no one denies that the demonic attack can bring illness. It can. No one denies that Christians can be oppressed in their emotions or psychologically attacked by demons. They can. 
No one denies that Satan can speak through Christians. Of course he can. Certainly he does. But that's not demon possession. That's not ekbalo. That's not casting out. The Bible and the biblical emphasis is always on resisting Satan that he may flee from you. Being wary of the wiles of Satan. Be sober so he will not trick you or deceive you or use you. Um, the biblical emphasis is always on resistance, struggling in your prayer life, living a crucified life, picking up the shield of faith, things like this, using the sword of the Spirit. These are the emphasis that the Scripture gives for Christians dealing with demons. No place is the term deliverance used in the New Testament in that sense. No place. The Bible doesn't teach deliverance in that sense. And no place is a demon cast out of a believer. What you have here are people wanting an instamatic solution to their problems. Deliverance ministry has become the equivalent of microwave ovens and instamatic photographs. Instead of picking up your cross, living a crucified life, resisting Satan, growing in grace, picking up the shield of faith, using to learn the, use, learning to use the sword of the Spirit, putting on the helmet of salvation, we wind up with a quick fix solution to our problems, which are not solutions at all. Promising people freedom, they put them into more bondage. Who's getting the demons cast out this week? The same ones who got them cast out last week. Look at what kind of Christians get caught up in deliverance ministry. Those who have a very weak or shallow knowledge of the Word of God. Those who have emotional problems. Those who have compulsive personalities. Certain psychological types. When you see the phenomena of people, demons going out of Christians, and the manifestations going out of people who are saved, that can be one of three things, or four things. One, maybe they were never saved to begin with. Sometimes it might be. There's a lot of people who come into a charismatic experience who've never been truly born again. They joined the movement. This is particularly true among charismatic Catholics. For a Bible-believing Christian to be demon-possessed, they must be backslidden. Now, a backslider can be demon-possessed. You think about Saul. He became backslidden, and he was demon-possessed. A backslider can be demon-possessed. But somebody who's walking with Jesus... Cannot be. Oppressed, yes. Paul faced demonic oppression. Oppressed, yes. But wherever you have oppression in the Bible, the way of dealing with it is never casting out. It's never ekbalo. It's always healing. It's always resisting. It's always putting on the armor. It's always your prayer life. It's always walking in the spirit that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So somebody has a lust problem. That's a common one. I point this out because I had a friend whose wife left him. His wife left him. And she backslid and fell away from the Lord and left him. And this guy, when he was sex-driven and didn't have a wife anymore, he would fall into some kind of sexual sin. So he would go and get the demons cast out of him. And every couple of weeks it would happen again and he'd go back and he'd go back and he'd go back. But his problem never got any worse. People will do that with anger. People will do that with everything. What it is, is the devil tricking Christians to use unbiblical means to deal with their problems. If he can get you to use unscriptural means to try to deal with your problems, you'll never get the victory over them. The Bible emphasizes rebuking, resisting, putting on the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword, the word of God, going to war against it. Walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So instead of emphasizing walking in the spirit, what do they do? Emphasize deliverance. And they go to some charlatan or something like this, getting the demons cast out all the time. There have been people who have built their whole ministries on this stuff. Deliverance ministers. Yeah, deliverance ministers. Send over two cheeseburgers with raw onions. That's deliverance ministry. And there's no biblical basis to what you're seeing. None of it. It's only tricking Christians to try to oppose Satan and, the, and deal with their flesh with models and methods that are not scriptural. Christians can be oppressed not possessed, unless they fall away from the Lord. When it's oppression, the biblical term is never cast out. And the way we deal with our sin problems is not going up getting the demons cast out. It's something very different. Now, how do you explain the manifestations when you see Christians doing this? Assuming they were saved and they're not backslidden. 
So maybe they, maybe if, they, if it is a genuine thing, they either were not saved or they're backslidden. But let's look further. One is the same reason you see people going down when God didn't knock them down. Slain in the Spirit. There is a biblical slain in the Spirit in John 1, but much of what you see is not. What you basically see today is hypnotic induction. In Wesley's ministry, or in the, in the it was unsaved people going down under the power of God and repenting. It was not Christians acting like jerks. What you see is stage hypnotism. It's hypnotic induction. That's all it is. Anybody could do it. Within ten minutes, I could show you how to do that. So these people become, through hypnotic induction, you find that who's susceptible, who's skeptical, who's hyper-susceptible. Those personality types will be the ones who will manifest that stuff. The same as the stage hypnotist can get somebody to do it. Somebody will do it through power of his suggestion, hypnotic seduction, combined with spiritual seduction because they take Bible verses out of context. So you're dealing with two powerful forces. Hypnotic induction, a powerful psychological force, and spiritual seduction, a powerful spiritual force. That's the first reason. The second is they make a negative confession. Not in the positive negative sense of the positive thinking creatures. Negative confession in the sense if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, Jesus can come inside of you. Well, if you begin believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, you're demonized. You're giving Satan a mandate to take ground in your life you shouldn't have. You begin believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that he has ground in your life that he doesn't. <laughs> you're fooling around with something. You're opening the, you're giving the keys to the burglar. Uh, it is just not scriptural. It does not help people. It does no good. It does no long-term good. Some people may get better, but if they do get better, it's not because of deliverance. It's because they've otherwise grown in their Christian faith. Deliverance ministry becomes an excuse for not picking up our cross, an excuse for not putting on the armor, an excuse for not picking up the sword, an excuse for not living the crucified life, and it becomes a deception to get Christians from having true victory. It only puts them in bondage. And some people have built their whole career, their whole ministry, on this deception. They've built their whole ministry on it. And therefore, they don't want to lose it. They'll defend it to the hilt. But they can't defend it on the basis of the Word of God. I've got a written question here. I'll try and make sense of it. Um, how should Christians, particularly in the churches of certain people, go along with a minister, for example, who denies the resurrection and is a university teacher and ministers at a, ch at a local church? How should they respond to that? When you are in a church that's that heretical, now, by heretical, understand what we're saying. If someone is replaced with this, supersessionism, that's a false doctrine, but I wouldn't call it heresy. You understand? This is something more fundamental. If Christ is not risen, we're the most foolish of all men. It undermines the truth of Scripture, the authority of the Gospel. If there's a minister who has done that, and you're in a church like that, you have one of two choices. Either God wants you to stand up and fight, or stand up and leave. But don't stay and pretend it's all right. Now, if you do stand up and fight, expect you may get thrown out. That's okay. The early Jewish Christians never wanted to leave the temple and the synagogue, but they wouldn't compromise the truth, so they were thrown out. Wesley never wanted to leave the Church of England, but he wouldn't compromise the truth, so he was thrown out. The Reformers, for all of their faults, never wanted to leave the Roman Church, but for they wouldn't compromise, so they were thrown out. If the Lord needs you to stand up and be a voice against it, make sure you do stand and make sure your voice is heard, but expect the consequences. Stand up and fight or stand up and leave. That is not a church. It's the house of heresy. It's apostate. If Christ is not risen from the dead, we're the most foolish of all men. The man is a heretic and has no right to be minister of an evangelical church. None. He should be called a heretic and an apostate for what he is. He's misleading God's people. He's feeding God's people to the wolves. That's what he's doing. He's a wolf. He's not a, he's not a shepherd. He's a wolf. <laughs> Any more questions? Fundamental to Christianity are three things. There are many, but these are three anyway. Faith, hope, and holy love. Can you tell us any examples of churches that we could regard as models, no matter where they are, or if not, can you say where there might be some that are coming into being? Yes. There's a fundamental schism coming to the body of Christ between the churches that will remain loyal to Jesus and the Word of God and the, words who, and the ones who won't. 
United States of America and South Africa are two nations that have a propensity for exporting their rubbish. A lot of other nations have a propensity for buying it. For some reason, people don't want what's best in America. They don't want David Hunt or David Wilkerson. They want Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Madeline Hickey, something like this. Look to the faithful people. Look to the leaders who are telling you the truth. David Wilkerson is one man. I don't know him well, but I know him. He's an honest man of God. I'm not saying he's perfect, but he's an honest man of God. His church is a good church. It's biblical. It's Bible-based. It's Christ-centered. In all of these denominations, the Assemblies of God have reached an all-time low, but I know churches in the Assemblies of God, even in this nation, that are all right, that are Bible-based, that are Christ-centered. You will find individual congregations in the Assemblies of God, which are good. I go to an Assemblies of God church in England, which is good, even though most of it has gone to the hill. The Christian Missionary Alliance is perhaps the best denomination left in the Western world. Perhaps the best denomination. It is the most, it, it is given no place to liberal theology or ecumenism. It's remained Bible-based and it's remained with a, a high view of missions and evangelism. Of all the denominations, the Christian Missionary Alliance is probably one of the best in the, in, in the, in the world. One of the best. I'm not saying the only one, but one of the best. Are uh, the Assemblies of God in Italy? Countries that have held to traditional, uh, churches that have held to traditional Pentecostalism are quite good. There are a number of good churches. And even in the bad denominations, there are individually good congregations. But yet, as I said, there will be a split. A split will come. We have a tape dealing with this subject called The House of David and the House of Saul. Uh, this schism will come. Uh, in New Zealand, I know some good churches and I know some good people. But I cannot say I know of a good denomination anymore. The Anglicans, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, particularly Elam, have all gone down very, very low away from the Word of God. Yet within them, within every one of them, I can still point to individually good congregations and good people. But that's not only in New Zealand, that's a global truth. Okay, lady at the back. Thank you. I just want to say I'm really impressed with what you've been sharing and I agree with you. One thing I want to ask you is, have you got all this stuff written down? And I want to ask you about where you see women in the place of ministry. Do you see them in the apostolic or the uh, fivefold ministry gift or ascension gift roles? Or do you believe that they should remain silent in the church? I'd like to know what your view is. And if you've got all this stuff written down, I'd be grateful to know. We have a tape called The Daughters of Zion where we deal with the subject of women in ministry. It's a complicated subject. Uh, I believe the first and foremost ministry of a Christian woman is to be a help me to her husband. In the Bible, whenever God used women, their head was covered. Not necessarily meaning a literal hat, but it meant under the protective authority of a male. When God used Esther, there was Mordecai. When God used Deborah, there was Barak. You see the same in the New Testament with Priscilla and Aquila and so on. God does not use women in senior leadership. They're always under the protective authority of a male. That's what having your head covered really means. That's a spiritual principle on back of it, which is not to insult anyone's tradition of wearing a veil to church. I'm simply saying the spiritual meaning on back of it is what's more important. I know a woman in England who wears her, a hat to the shower, but she's got the biggest mouth you ever heard in your life, and her husband's on a leash. She's always, but she's always got the hat on. <laughs> the nature of women has to be understood. Pay attention. God gave certain aspects of his divine nature to males and certain to females. Okay? The fall has messed this up. Because of the fall of man, men were never as sensitive as women, but because of the fall they become insensitive. Women were never hypersensitive, but because of the fall, they become hypersensitive. So because of the fall of man, men have a propensity in their fallen nature to be insensitive, and women have a propensity to be hypersensitive. When a husband and wife get saved, normally it's the wife who was saved first. If the husband gets saved first, it's usually not difficult to see the wife come to faith. 
But when a woman has an unsaved husband, it can be much more difficult. It's usually the wife who gets saved first. Why? Because women are more sensitive. It's easier for the Lord to speak to them. When a husband and wife pray together for direction, it's usually the wife who will hear from the Lord first and clearest. Why? Because women are more sensitive. A Christian husband is reliant upon the sensitivity of his wife. Because male and sensitive. However, anything God intends for good, the devil will use for evil. So because it's easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it's also easier for women to hear the voice of another spirit. Women are vulnerable to spiritual seduction. And sometimes even physical seduction, as Paul writes. You know, those false men who prey on women and stuff like this in the church. The serpent beguiles the woman. Serpent is, of course, a picture of Satan, the seducer. He beguiled the woman. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. Male authority is not based on big muscles or domination. It's based on protection. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ did the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself for her, it says in Ephesians 5. That's how husbands are called to be the head of their wives. A self-giving husband who's willing to lay his life down for his bride the way Christ laid his life down for his bride, those kinds of marriages have fewer submission problems. It's the ones where the husband, the the, the initiative is always on the male to be self-giving to the wife. Nonetheless, a wife must realize that even though they're co-equal in Christ, the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is of the church. And in purposes of ministry, it's the same. When God uses women, it's always with their head covered under the protection and direction of a male authority. I do not believe in women apostles, but I do believe that you have one woman, Judas, right? She was Her husband was an apostle and she was with him. Husband and wife ministry teams, absolutely. Whenever you see God using a woman, her head will be covered in some way. If, her, if she doesn't have a husband and her father's a believer or an older brother, that's her covering. If she has not that, it should be the male leadership of the church. But women must have their head covered to operate in the ministry. Now, there's more to it than that, but that's, in a nutshell, the answer. Does that make sense? Do you agree with it? Good. Again, I've never known a pastor who's a good pastor who wasn't a good pastor because he had a wife standing next to him, advising him, praying with him. I have no problem with women pastoring other women. But the idea of women being the senior pastor of a church, I believe, is unscriptural. Uh, Some time ago, I went to a Bill Sabritsky meeting, uh, and during the course of which, uh, Bill Sabritsky said, uh, in terms of tongues, that if you've never done it before, you can just open your mouth, and the first thing that comes out, like, ba, 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 which, believe it or not, he said is a uh, Hindu dialect, just practice it, and it'll get better. Does this fill in with the uh, biblical practice of speaking in tongues? Once again, man-made doctrine. Show me in the Bible where it works that way. He can't show you in the Bible. It's man-made doctrine. Laodicea, people's opinions. There's nothing in the Bible that would suggest that that is true or that is so. One time in my life, one time in the Middle East, I had a word of knowledge. It was only five words. However, it was in a language I didn't understand, but the person I said it to did. It caused that person to get saved. Uh, I've seen the authentic, and I've seen the counterfeit. But the idea of just open your mouth and move your mouth, whatever comes out, that's ridiculous. Tongues can be purely psychological, and a lot of what you see today is psychological. Tongues can be demonic. Witch doctors pray in tongues, cults pray in tongues, spiritists pray in tongues. Shamanists pray in tongues. Mormons pray in tongues. Tongues can be learned or contrived. Tongues can be some combination of the above. Or it can be an authentic gift of the Holy Spirit. If it's an authentic gift of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't require the design mechanisms of man for it to happen. Right, any more questions, please? Please come forward. Last night, and going back to our roots. Um, okay, but it has to be brief because it doesn't yeah. really fit the subject. Okay. Um, 
I'm just been wondering earlier this year, looking at Acts 15, verse 6, where there was a question of Paul having gone out to the Gentiles, Gentiles becoming believers, and the Judaizers saying that they must be circumcised as well as having faith in Jesus. And the local church in Jerusalem came up with the decision of verse 20 about four things. And yes. I'm wondering in today, I see in the church two things applying, but since it was given to Gentiles, I'm wondering, do the four things apply? And I'll just quickly read them. Yeah, not, not anything strangled, things with the blood. And the blood, and it's the blood I'm wondering about. Does it apply for today? And in what? In the opinion way? of Derek Prince, yes, and I would agree with him. I wouldn't eat black pudding in England. No, but I mean like meat with blood full stop, because when I look in the Old Testament, it said you were to pour all of the blood. Yeah, that's right. The blood should be drained from the veins. That's one of the things that makes kosher meat kosher, is that the blood is drained. I would not intentionally eat anything with blood in it. The life is in the blood, but it's more than the symbolism. Uh, yeah. The consummation of blood had a pagan association, so that was another aspect to it. All four of those things still apply today. Now, of course, because of the changes in culture, they may not become issues in most, most in, 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 in modern context. But the doctrinal truths in those four things still apply today. Absolutely. Like, like I've been blooding mints, for example, so there's no blood in it. Do I need to do that? Can I have steak and chops? Or does it mean I've got to blood those? It, it's the principle. It's, it's the principle. It's not that you've got to get every drop of blood out. It's just not having a blood meal. You understand? We've got four more minutes. Time for, I'd say, one, one or two more questions. Come down here, please. No, just could you say it more clearly about the the meat? I mean, the meat is slaughtered in our meat industry. I mean, is it safe to eat our meat? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear you properly, sorry. There are those who would talk about kosherut eating kosherut for health reasons. Okay, that's a fine. If you want to do that, that's up to you. What I'm saying is the context of Acts 15 was avoiding something which had paganistic connotation. Okay? But having paganistic connotation. It would be similar to eating food sacrificed to idols. It was the paganistic connotation that made the thing wrong. However, I would also say that, you know, the idea of eating a strangled animal or something like that, there's also the humanitarian aspect to it. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. That's, the, that's right. That's, I would have no problem, would not see that in any way as contravening Act 15. Time for one more question. Thank you. Let it go. Time for one and a half more questions. <laughs> come over here. Can you come here, please? My question is just goes um, on from what the lady was saying about the blood and offered to idols. But when, surely when uh, Paul was at the meeting in um, Jerusalem, it ended up that if those who, that the Hellenists provided that it was not from the gods or or that they had no belief. Um, You mentioned, for instance, I'm not quite sure what you said. That I think it was that you would not eat black pudding. Well, I, I, I love not. black pudding. Okay. If it's, I'm not here in New Zealand. Next time, bring me one, will you? And, um, but um, I just wanted you to speak on that. Well, I did. Again, you were right. It was the paganistic connotation of the practice that made it detestable. It would have been a bad testimony to the... Uh, to the Gentiles because of eating food sacrificed to idols eating things with blood in it would have had a cult and paganistic connotations within their cultural context that was a major aspect of the reason well the text says abstain from, from eating blood it says to do that and there was nothing in the Bible which revoked it personally I would not do it but neither would I become legalistic about it and make sure that you run a saw line solution through every grain of meat before you swallow it. It would be the principle I'd look at. Okay, time for one more Where question. Where that is an issue now is in uh, 
with the Maasai tribe in Kenya. When they get saved, again, they have blood and milk. They give the babies blood and milk. But giving the blood is part of their religious culture, you see? So the missionaries tell them, you know, or, or, or the evangelists, they have their own evangelists now who are Maasai, not to do it anymore because of the conflict between culture and the Bible. We always choose the Bible. It's more of an issue in Kenya. Like, the Maasai tribe would be closer to the cultural situation Paul was addressing, or the apostles were addressing, than we would have today in Western society. It would be closer. To them, it's still an issue, because there's a pagan idea in their culture to the blood. Right. That's great to know it counted as salvation for eating a sausage, but anyway, carry on. And this Toronto Blue thing, uh, most people have probably seen the interplay of tongues between uh, Rodney Howard Brown and Kenneth Copeland. Would you say that was a cult, a cult tongue? We have some people saved out of the occult who looked at that. We have ex-Hindus who looked at it, who were saved out of Hinduism, who said that's what they were saved out of. There's also a lady with a, who was a witch in Auckland, Julie something. She had been a witch, a practicing witch, and she saw that and she said that's similarly occultic. That's what they've said. What I'm prepared to say is whether it was some kind of simply a fleshly display or that devil, the devil was using or something that was directly demonic is irrelevant. It was not the biblical practice of tongues. No place you see people talking to each other in tongues in that way. No place. It says you, mis- you utter mysteries unto God and let one interpret uh, it was just basically mockery. And just think, what's Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 14? If unsaved people enter and see that, they'll say you were mad. Any unsaved person watching Mike Evans, Rodney Brown, and Kenneth Copeland who saw that would say you're mad. And to see people like Wayne Hughes and, and uh, Bill Sapritsky and Ian Bilby to endorse it and bring it into this country is a disgrace. Those leaders are a disgrace to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for that. We're now entering the uh, second stage of our session proper. If you want to stand up and stretch your legs for a couple of seconds, that's great. Turn with me, please, to Second Peter. Second Peter. If you don't have a Bible, please share a Bible with the person who is next to you. talk about a few things about the background of Second Peter, first of all, before we read our main text or base text. Peter's epistle, second epistle, like his first, is Hebraic. Like the epistle of James, and like the epistle to the Hebrews, like Matthew's gospel, and like John's gospel, It's Hebraic in character. It was written to Jewish believers, Jewish people who believed Jesus was the Messiah, Messianic Jews. That is not to suggest for one instant that its content does not apply to non-Jews. It is simply saying to understand what he's really trying to get at, we have to understand the context in which he wrote it and whom he was writing it to. So he's addressing issues, drawing on a Jewish understanding of Jesus as the Messiah, and on issues that would have been of some concern to Jewish believers in the first century. Secondly, the themes he develops in his second epistle, which we're going to look at, are a further development of some of the themes he introduces in his first epistle. And both Petrine epistles are source-critically related and thematically related to the epistle of Jude. They have some kind of common source with Jude. Peter influenced Jude. Jude influenced Peter. And they address similar issues from different aspects. So we have to understand those things. Thirdly, Second Peter is eschatological. In the beginning, he begins to alluding to things about the last days. But as he gets further into the epistle, into chapter 3, bearing in mind it was a letter and there's no chapter divisions in the original Greek text, Then you see what he's heading for. He's aiming at something eschatological, something for the last days. 
This principle in Midrash is known as Kal Vahomer, Kal Vahomer, light to heavy. It was the first midot of Rabbi Hillel. Something which is generally true becomes specifically true in the last days. Or something that's true in a light situation becomes particularly true in a heavy situation. Here we're applying it to the last days. For instance, Hebrews 10.25 says the following. Hebrews 10.25 says, Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another. Fellowship is always important, but especially as you see the day approaching. What's true in a light situation becomes particularly true in a heavy situation. Things that are always true become particularly true in the last days, for instance. Understand? Jesus spoke of false teachers, false prophets, and false messiahs. They've always been around. Always. But in the last days, they become particularly abundant. Something generally true becomes specifically true in a heavy situation. Okay? Things that are generally true become especially true in the last days. This is what Peter's saying. The things in the beginning passages of Second Peter are always true. But as you read the epistle further, you see what he's getting at in the overall theme of his letter. They will become particularly true as we get closer to the return of Jesus. Now before we look at our main text in chapter 2, let's begin in chapter 1 and notice a few features. He develops a progression of Christian behavior. And again, it relates in part back to what happened in his previous epistle. In his previous epistle, chapter 5, verse 8 of First Peter, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith. Notice again, unlike the deliverance ministers, the emphasis is not on casting out or deliverance, but on resisting. But more than that, Peter, this same Peter, who preached, preached his charisma in Acts chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost, emphasizes the importance for sobriety, being sober. And this is even more clear in the Greek text. Speaking of the last days, similarly, Paul speaks in Second Timothy of the need for Sobriety, being sober. If you don't be sober, if you're not sober, you're going to be vulnerable to deception and demonic attack. Today we're being told to get drunk. <laughs> you're leaving yourself wide open to spiritual deception. Drunkenness is called the deed of the flesh in Galatians. The fruit of the spirit is self-control. A lack of self-control will always leave someone open to some kind of demonic invasion. That guy this morning, now he obviously has mental problems, but the man lacks self-control. When people lack self-control, they become willing vehicles to some kind of demonic animation. A lack of sobriety will open you up for deception. Now Peter gives us a progression. Look what he says. Verse 5. Of First Peter, Second Peter, Chapter One. He warns about how, that we've escaped from the corruption that's in the world by its lust, etc. But he says, for this reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. In your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. In your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a chain. Any chain is as strong as its weakest link. If one of these things is missing, everything else suspended on the chain falls. We have people today saying brotherly kindness and love. We don't need knowledge. Doctrine divides. Well, that's not brotherly kindness and that's not love. That's allowing a little baby to put his finger in an electric socket because you want to be kind to him. It's not love. 
not kindness. What you will also have, if one of these is missing, it all goes. Moral excellence. Again, moral excellence. In England, we've had the worst of it because this country got the Toronto thing from England. We had the 9 o'clock service in the north of England where the women were dancing topless in the church at the Toronto meeting, St. Thomas Crook Anglican Church and got on television. Over 20 women were sexually abused by the minister Mark Brain in his New Age service at the at Toronto meetings in Sheffield, England. The London Healing Mission, where the women were removing their underwear in church and having holy war- communion wine poured on their genitals in their Toronto meetings. And of course, we've got the videos we showed last year in New Zealand with women stripping in church and rolling on the floor having sexual orgasm, saying it was the Holy Spirit. Moral excellence, please, sir, we're recording. Moral excellence. Again, moral excellence will go. It'll go. The church will become discredited by the lack of moral excellence. Our testimony will be injured. Now let's look further. Notice the linchpin. In your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. So you've got brotherly love on one end of the chain, and then you have moral excellence on the other. But what's holding these things together is self-control and knowledge. If there's a lack of self-control or a lack of knowledge of the Word of God, what's going to happen? Moral excellence and authentic brotherly love will become nothing. They won't exist. They'll fall. A lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Lack of self-control. Be sober, Peter says. You see a lack of sobriety and a lack of knowledge of the Word of God. Some kind of moral ill repute will follow it. And brotherly love will ultimately be compromised. Just look at it. People who would not accept this phenomena. What has happened? I know cases where marriages have virtually gone on the rocks. Churches have split. Christians had been friends for years. They were turned against because they wouldn't embrace Toronto. They were turned against. Not because of any doctrinal reason. There was no knowledge involved. They had no doctrinal reason for saying, we'll have nothing more to do with you, or you have a problem or a wrong spirit. There was no knowledge. It was just they said it. Because they lacked sobriety and they themselves lacked knowledge. Where's the brotherly love? We had Rodney Howard Brown's bodyguards came out in Birmingham, England, grabbed one guy who was giving out pamphlets warning people about Toronto, and he grabbed the guy's throat. South African guy, his bodyguard was, and said, we're going to find where you live and break your windows. <laughs> Is Rodney Brown, I'll give you the five-finger ministry. This is what they have. This is what you're dealing with. No love. There's no love. No real love. And there's no moral excellence. Because there's no knowledge and there's no self-control. A spiritual man is spiritual in, to the degree he is in control of himself. And he's in control of himself to the degree that God is in control of him. Let's look. Be sober. Now, I have no problem with someone being overcome with the Spirit. But that will not manifest itself in a lack of self-control. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said these men are not drunk. And they heard the mighty deeds of God. They weren't hearing gibberish or slurred speech or drunken talk. They said they heard the mighty deeds of God. 3,000 were convicted and saved the first day. Conviction was brought to their hearts. Peter's message, his charisma was coherent, it was cogent, there was no lack of self-control. Now let's go on. Verse 13. I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you may be able to call these things to mind. Peter knows he's going to die. Not simply that he's going to die, but what seems to be more important to him 
is that his disciples, who he's led to Christ and who he's discipled and trained up, were not going to see him again. So when Peter knows he's not going to see his disciples again, he did what Jesus did before he was crucified. He talks to his disciples and reminds them about the things that are most important. When Jesus knew he was going to die, he spent his time with his disciples, reminding them of the things that are most important. And it's no coincidence, on the Olivet Discourse, the biggest section of Bible passages we have that Jesus talked about before he left, on the last days. The biggest, the biggest, Matthew 24 and 25, the most amount of things that Jesus left with his disciples were things dealing with the last days. And what does that tell you? And within his discourse on the last days, he warned about deception. In the Olivet Discourse, as we'll see, he talked about wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, all that stuff. But the thing he kept coming back to was deception. So he warned his disciples about the most before he died. When Paul was going to die, read his epistles. He did the same as Peter, didn't he? He reminded his disciples about the things that are most important. Or even when he was not going to see the Ephesians again, he reminded them about what was most important. Let's look at the book of Acts. Chapter 20, verse 30. And from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Verse 29, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. When he's not going to see them again, he begins warning them about deception. When the true shepherds go away, the false shepherds show up in sheep's clothing. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Here is where we go wrong. False teachers, false prophets, false messiahs. False teachers, false prophets, and false messiahs. Let's understand why we're told this so crucially. Why did Jesus reiterate it so much? Turn with me, please, over to Matthew 24. He begins by speaking about the events of 70 A.D., which were partially fulfilled in 70 A.D., but which typifies something to happen at the end of the world. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him. Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone will be thrown down upon another. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him, privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The first words out of Jesus' mouth. He's going to leave his disciples now. He's only going to talk about what's important. What's going to come after I leave? What does Paul do when he's going to leave? This is what's going to come after I leave. What does Peter say in Second Peter? This is what's going to come after I leave. They all hit the same thing. When Peter knows he's going, when Jesus knows he's going, when Paul knows he's going, they all hit the same point. What's the first thing out of his mouth? What will be the sign of the end? Is it a credit card, silicone chip on your wrist? No. Now that will happen or whatever, but that's not the sign. Is it the Jews returning to Israel? Well, Luke 21, verse 24, that will happen. That's a sign, but that's not the first thing he says. The resurrection of the Roman Empire? Likewise. I don't deny the prophetic significance of what you see happening in the Reconfederation of Europe as per Daniel's prophecies, but that's not the first thing he talks about. The first thing he talks about, what will the sign be of your coming in the end of the age? See to it that no one misleads you. The first word out of his mouth. The first thing Jesus says, 
Take care that no one misleads you. My ambition is evangelism, evangelizing people of other faiths, beginning with the Jews and increasingly Roman Catholics. That's my interest. But as I told our brother Barry Smith many times, Jesus said to make disciples, not converts. What kind of a church am I going to put people into? The zoos we have today? He didn't say make people into converts. He said make disciples. Hence, I'm forced to concentrate on Bible teaching, which is not what I want to do. I'd rather concentrate on evangelism. But I have no choice. I get no pleasure from going around speaking about error in the church. It's not my interest. But what are you going to do? No revival will ever come. We'll never reach these people in New Age and these other religions until we have a church capable of doing it, until we clean the garbage out. No choice. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Now, notice it's mislead you. And he goes on to say, there will be many false Christs. The only thing a false Christ means in the Greek language is someone with a false anointing. The only thing a false Christ necessarily means in the Greek language or the Hebrew language Sodom Mashiach is someone with a false anointing. That's all. Then he says, you'll hear of wars, rumors of wars, so you're not frightened. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation, famines, earthquakes. All these things are the beginning of birth pangs. You have remote signs and imminent signs. Yes, the fact that we see more and more wars, more and more earthquakes, higher on the Richter scale, despite the dramatic improvements in agricultural technology, more people starving to death than ever before, all that is a prophetic significance. It tells us that we're drawing close to the last days. I don't deny that. But it also tells us that he's not at the door yet. These are the beginning of birth pangs. They tell us it's getting closer. But that's not what tells us it's at the door. Then he goes further. They'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. At that time, many will fall away and deliver one another and hate one another. Notice, many will fall away. The apostasia. I have no doubt in my mind that things like ecumenism and Toronto are preludes to the apostasia, the falling away in Second Thessalonians. However, let's look more clearly. Persecution will not begin with Islam or secular governments. Persecution will begin with Christians falling away and betraying other Christians. Persecution will begin in the church. Isaiah 66, 5, your brethren will hate you because of the word. Many will fall away and betray one another. When real persecution comes, and the church will be persecuted even in Western countries, when real persecution comes, let me tell you what kind of Christians are going to fall away and betray you. Let me tell you what kind of Christians are going to fall away tomorrow and betray you and your children. The kinds of Christians that will fall away and betray you and your children tomorrow are the ones who are following Rodney Brown, Kenneth Copeland, Bill Sapritsky, Marilyn Hickey, Mara Cirillo today. That's who's going to fall away and betray you tomorrow, those who follow those men today. That's who's going to betray you tomorrow. And then what does he say? Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. He comes back to it again. Then he goes on in talking about the gospel being preached and he who endures to the end and the abomination of desolations and tribulation. But then in verse 23, more deception. 
Here's the Messiah. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Four times he comes to deception. Four times. He goes on again. But then he says after that, I told you in advance. Verse 26, comes back to it again. If they say to you, he's in the wilderness, don't go there. In the inner rooms, don't believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You must understand the spirit of seduction inside of dominionism, kingdom now theology. These people with the man-child manifest sons of God doctrine. The vineyard, the whole bit. They say that Christ returns to the church before he returns for it. The parousia, the return of Christ, happens by the church being triumphant after this latter day rain thing happens. And the return of Christ is realized in the church. And then he comes back. That's what they teach. That's what's on back of the March for Jesus organizers like Graham Kendrick. That's what's on back of the vineyard. You have hyper-Calvinistic post-millennialism is one pillar married to charismania. Now the Bible does say the gospel will be preached. Do I believe in a great end times revival? I do. But I also believe in a great end times falling away. These people are already being seduced into believing and are being used of Satan to seduce others into believing the very thing Jesus warned against. Somehow the kingdom comes in the church. You understand? That's what they're saying. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Verse 21, 22. Partially fulfilled, only partially, in the story of Antiochus, Apophanes, and the Maccabees. I kept looking, and that horn, the Antichrist, was waging war with the saints and overpowering them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. When do the saints take possession of the kingdom? When the Ancient of Days comes. They say no before the Ancient of Days comes. He, he comes to the church in this latter day reign movement and we take over. Jesus is not coming for a triumphant church. He's coming with a triumphant church that's been resurrected and raptured. The very thing he was warning about. He's in the inner rooms, he's in the wilderness. Somehow it's within the church. Don't believe that stuff. They're going the very way that Jesus wants. They're being set up for the whole thing. Trying to say that his return will happen in some way other than the Bible says. He's coming in the clouds and all that. Yeah, but the clouds are, of course, clouds of witnesses, aren't they? We're told witness, clouds are figures of witnesses. He's coming with the, saints, with the church, with the saints. Now let's go back to Matthew 24. In Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, Jerusalem would be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles. Yes, these events in the Middle East fulfill prophecy. Wars, famines, earthquakes, rumors of wars, yes. All those are signs. But he mentions those things once. Four times he comes to deception. False teachers, false prophets, false messiahs. People with a false anointing. Most Christians say, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the Christadelphians, that's the Mormons, the R.A. Krishnas, the Baha'is. Without doubt, the proliferation of these cults is in itself of some prophetic significance. I don't deny that. 
But in the context, those are not the false prophets that Jesus was warning about. They're not the ones Paul was warning about. They're not the ones Peter was walking about. They were warning about the ones who would come among us. If possible, the elect will be deceived. Don't worry about the Jehovah's Witnesses. The only time they deceive a Christian if it's a new one. They get newly saved. They might get a hold of that. That's it. Don't worry about the JWs or the Mormons or the RA Christians or the Baha'is. If you don't want to be deceived, you worry about Rodney Brown. You worry about Kenneth Copeland. You worry about John Arnott. You worry about Marilyn Hickey. And you worry about those leaders who are bringing you under their umbrella. Like Wayne Hughes and Bill Sapritsky and Wynn Lewis and so on. That's who you worry about. Now look at verse 24. False Christ and false prophets will arose, rise and show great signs and wonders, if possible, to mislead even the elect. The way the Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron, that's the way the Antichrist and false prophet will counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. Paul explains what Jesus was talking about. Paul's commentary on Matthew 24 is in 2 Timothy. This is the Pauline explanation or the Pauline commentary, inspired commentary, on the Olivet Discourse. It's also in, in Thessalonians, but here we're looking at Timothy. You have no chapter divisions in the original Greek once again. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. Realize this, in the last days difficult times will come. So right away, the stage is set. It's talking about the last days. Same as Matthew 24, right? The stage is set in its time frame. And he describes what it would be like, what society would be like, and then what the church would be like. He talks about those immoral people who will captivate weak women. And so on and so on. But now let's look at chapter... 3, verse 16. All Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. All Scripture. Old and New Testament. That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Notice when the Scripture speaks of someone being equipped for the ministry, for being trained to do the work of God, what does it say? Does it emphasize spirit baptism? No. Does it emphasize speaking in tongues? No. Does it emphasize miracles? No. Now again, I'm a Pentecostal. I believe in those things. Understood and practiced biblically. It emphasizes Scripture. If someone is not grounded in Scripture, they are not equipped for the ministry. Again, this is consistent with Paul's instruction. 1 Timothy chapter 3, an overseer must be able to teach. I would say that 80% of the people in the Assemblies of God ministry in England, Australia, and New Zealand, 80% are not equipped for the ministry. The younger generation, probably fewer than 10% are equipped for the ministry. They have no biblical right to stand in the pulpit. None. They can't rightly divide the Word of God. Anybody who would go for something like Toronto, seeing those videos, and looking at the doctrines of Copeland and Rodney Brown and Arnott, anybody who would bring a church into that is unfit to be a minister. Anybody. They don't know the Word of God. They're unable to teach. What do they do? What does Paul say they do? Wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they don't even know what they're talking about. Make confident assertions about matters they don't even know what they're talking about in First Timothy chapter 1. These guys are all over the place. Cole Springer, John Arnott, they're all over the place. All over. Now 
Now let's look at Timothy again. He says, talking about the last days, this is the context, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is different than Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus is always talking about Him in His exalted state. When when He's talking about Him in His exalted state, it's, it's Christ Jesus, never Jesus Christ. Who is to judge living in the dead by His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. The Greek word here is makrotumia. When it comes to people, the Bible says, Correct them with great patience and instruction. But when Paul talked about the leaders and the teachers who were misleading people, that was different. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 20. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander. It talks about them. Second Timothy, same thing. Alexander the coppersmith, he warns about it. He names those people who are leading God's people astray. That's why I will name people like Ian Bilby and, and, and Bill Sabritsky in your country. That's why I'll name them. They're leading God's people astray. For the people who are being led astray, I can have great patience and instruction. Nakrotumia. But for those who are doing the deceiving, no. They can't rightly divide the Word of God. They have no right to be a minister. Bill Zabritsky has no right whatsoever to be a minister. None. Not in the sense of leadership. None. His doctrine is totally shallow, hollow. He has no understanding of Scripture whatsoever, virtually. The man is, doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Not a clue. But that's what they look to. For he says... For the time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves Marilyn Hickey, Kenneth Copeland, and John Avanzini. Teachers in accordance with their own desire. Who will turn away their ears from the truth. Kingdom now, name it and claim it. And turn aside to myths. But you be sober. Once again, you'll be drunk. You'll be drunk in the Holy Ghost. Rodney Brown, the Holy Ghost bartender, have another drink? No. You'll be sober. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist or through your ministry. Notice he calls the last day's church, that's the emphasis, to the basic things. Preaching the gospel. Being willing to suffer in this world if necessary. Now, how will these teachers be? And what character will they come? Let's go back to chapter 3, verse 8. Just as Jonas and John Braze opposed Moses, so these men of opposed the truth, men of depraved mind. Rejected as regards to the faith. Men of depraved mind. Who were Jonas and John Braze? These men of depraved mind? Pharaoh's magicians. What did they do? Signs and wonders. Men of betrayed mind. John Arnott, Rodney Howard Brown, Kenneth Copeland, these are men of depraved mind. Who will deceive the elect. And men wanting to have their ears tickled will accumulate for themselves people like this. Turning their ears aside to mix. Look at the doctrines of these guys. Kenneth Copeland, Jesus Christ, became a demon in hell. Copeland could have died on the cross instead of Jesus. Satan got the victory on the cross and he gives this thing to Rodney Brown. <laughs> Rodney Brown, in his book that I have it, he says that Satan is manifesting, just praise God for it, at least something's happening. He's going to be praised. To be praised. Rodney Brown said he was preaching about hell. The more he described what hell was like, the more hysterically the people laughed. This is in context. I love to laugh. I laugh at Laurel and Hardy, the Marx Brothers. That's what makes me laugh. 
W.C. Fields. But when I think of my father who died without Christ and where he's spending eternity, as far as I can know, I can't laugh at that. You have an unsaved loved one, a father, a mother, someone you cared about who died without Christ. Can you laugh? Well, I can't laugh at that. That's depraved. Satan got the victory on the cross. The biggest failure in the Bible was God, as Copeland teaches. The biggest failure in the Bible was God. That's depraved. Men of depraved minds. Signs and wonders. Once again, biblically, Jesus never allowed signs and wonders to be the focus of his ministry. When he healed people, it was, shh, don't tell anybody. These signs follow. I believe in signs and wonders practiced biblically. These signs follow. When you find people putting signs and wonders at the center, they want to see a stage hypnotism show. Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign. When you find people chasing signs and wonders, Jesus called that wickedness and adultery. The whole vineyard ethos, power evangelism, power ministry, it is a big lie. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, the Jewish Feast of Light, but also the Jewish Feast of Miracles in John 10. They see the miracles and they try to stone him. For which of these miracles are you stoning me? That the vineyard says signs and wonders are the key to revival. But Jesus said, I did the signs and wonders, you've got to stone me anyway. In John 5 he said, you saw the signs and wonders, but you still don't accept. Where do they get this? They saw signs and wonders on Palm Sunday. A week later, the yell and crucify him. Who do you want to believe, John Wimber or Jesus Christ? Make up your mind. Personally, I believe Jesus Christ. John Wimber has made tremendous predictions that have failed to happen. The Word of God says he's a false prophet. And he's also a Gnostic. His mishandling of the Word of God is purely Gnostic. But let's go back. So Peter is then fully consistent with what Jesus and Paul say. And again, he's building up to a last day scenario the same. Now let's look further. Verse 19, he speaks about the transfiguration. Then he says, We have the prophetic word made sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Why? What's the lamp? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. The virgins needed oil in their lamp to see in the dark, as we pointed out last night. Those without a lamp in the dark with oil in it are going to be deceived when it gets dark in the last days. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And then he speaks to things. The dawn, the morning star arises in your hearts. All four Gospels associate the resurrection of Jesus with sunrise. The rising of the S-U-N becomes a metaphor for the rising of the S-O-N. But then he says, but first of all, know this, talking about No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was never made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Then he says, in contrast to this, verse 1, but false prophets arose. So you have to link that no prophecy is a matter of one's own interpretation with false prophets. The two are compared. Look what it says. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. No prophecy of Scripture as a matter of one's own interpretation. None. On back of all this Toronto promise keepers, all this stuff is vineyard. John Wimber. He's the granddaddy of it. Turn with me, please, back to the book of Joel, the basic vineyard text. Chapter 2. 